podcast as always i'm your host gary howard and let's see if i can get this done it's only been like the third or fourth time i've tried to record this episode but i don't know why it's not a in-depth story but i just have been having trouble with it but anyhow without further ado if you are a return listener thank you if you are a new listener let me tell you a little bit about what this is about i am a truck driver ot back to a truck driver otr I was driving a dump truck and took a break from this for about three months, which I think caused the problems I'm having right now. Had to reset it up and pretty much relearn how to do all this because I did not have time to do it the three months I was at home. But I talk about truck stops. I talk about murders that happen nearby it. And luckily, and so far I have not found none in a truck stop, but I try to stay with about 50 miles of the truck stop I talk about murder may involve rape or children so if this is not for you then thank you for even looking at me and but thank you and also I don't edit it usually what I record is what I put out and if you don't like you know if you don't like what you get then you get and that's easy but anyhow today's episode brings me to I've had this episode done for a while but Shreveport, Louisiana. Matter of fact, the funny story about this was I was going to this pilot truck stop, no Petro truck stop, when I was working for SRT, because this was one of their regular fuel stops that they like to go to. But I had to pass by the yard. But when you go by the yard, you have to go to a mandatory inspection bay. But and that you could be stuck there for days because they find any little thing wrong with the truck, even though if it does not violate DOT policy or not. You could be stuck there for days because they have no priority and they're backlogged of trucks. It's a big company, but they are out of business now. <laughs> Covenant bought them out and closed that facility, so that facility is no longer. But she called and asked me where I was going. I was like, well, I'm going to get fuel. They're like, well, why did you stop the yard? I just didn't listen to her, whatever. And she, she was bitching that I went 20 miles out of route. Well, I'm no longer, I work for a Prima Express. So if you're a truck driver and you need a job and you have experience and you don't mind long hours well here you go do what you need to do and they will leave you alone but the, i was going to the petro truck stop on i-20 exit 8 on it at the industrial loop in shreveport louisiana it has a overall 2.3 review of 268, 268 reviews people are not happy with this place as you see when i get to the reviews you know but you, right now as of an hour ago according to truckers path there are some spots left when well usually when i see a petro ta they say some spots left or lots of spots i wonder how many of them are not reserve spots because a lot of times a lot of these ta's and petros majority of the spots will be reserve spots and so you have to pay for them but that's them but diesel's 352 a gallon that is 349 a gallon there's 218 spots there but how many are free don't state how many are free how many are paid but yeah that is what it is so if you're ever driving through louisiana along i-20 or you're driving on vacation to shreveport and visit one of the many casinos they have there and you decide well i'm gonna come here and get a little bite to eat which I don't know why you would because the, the casinos probably have pretty way better place restaurants than this place you have the the Petro shopping center which has the regular fast food like microwavable hamburgers hot dogs and different things which today I'm in I'm actually in Texas today at a loves which loves are have the best hot dogs I believe now pet pilot and Petro they do have hot dogs but yeah they're not very good or you have the Iron Skillet, which is an American restaurant. I think a lot of them are buffet, just regular hamburgers, hot dogs, steak, bacon, eggs, and everything. And then you have a Wendy's and a Red Barn Cajun Market, a seafood restaurant. Let's get the full name of this Red Barn Cajun Crawfish and Seafood Market. And that has eight reviews, a three star. So those are the restaurants within a quarter mile 
if you end up buying by this place and you're stopping there and you want to get a bite to eat but let's see what truckers say about this place like I said they are not happy with it overall 2.3 review right off the back two days ago bug bug says this is the worst TA Petro I've come across the store sh the store showers and restrooms were filthy the shower room had piles of dirt hair in the corners the floors were sticky hmm the whole place had a strong smell of mildew the store was out of lo of a lot of items and uh, employees there just ignored me when I said hello and then thank you then another one said terrible one star review and then one person gave a four star regular truck stop with regular truck stop needs let's see what Mickey S thinks with his one star stupid people work at a truck stop don't try to get service there better do yourself and another one star outlaw says there is a lizard on the loose okay I guess I'm a lot lizard roaming the, the parking lot and a lot of them I'm not gonna read all the most majority of these one stars reviews talk about how it's a drop yard a lot of drop trailers and nowhere to park so a couple of people says clean for the most part everybody's bitching about how there's no park is terrible place is filthy and it's a drop yard everybody's they can't find a place to park because everybody's dropping the trailers at this place which I think is kind of well if they drop the trailer and they bobtail home bobtail where they need to go what's the difference if they drop their instead of dropping they leave the whole truck there and have someone come pick them up the, the outcome is still the same if the tractor's connected to the trailer or not your ass that still don't have a place to park go find someone else the park and stop bitching <laughs> but there you go there is the Shreveport in Louisiana we're about eight miles is exit eight so eight miles from Texas so there you go where I'm at right now and the case that I'll be covering during this when I, I found there is Brandy Eileen Holmes and her boyfriend Robert Coleman and I first found all these a lot of these I find the way I find cases too is a lot of times I'll look at Murderpedia for that location would be my first source and then I'll look around that area and this is what I found a kind of interesting case nothing spectacular but it's the first time I've ever heard of fetal alcohol syndrome I didn't even know that was a thing until this and this is what ultimately she be could be saying why she did what she did was because of this by the way my truck is running and I don't not gonna turn off I'm gonna try this as a new episode see how if it's a uh, distraction or not well like I said it took I've tried to record this three or four times so far and failed every time so hopefully I get it right this time but yeah Brandy Holmes and her boyfriend Robert Coleman let's talk about a little bit about Brandy Holmes she was born on July 25th 1979 and she grew up in a pretty troubled household I want to say troubled but a very big party and atmosphere which her mom loved to party kind of like Carla Faye Tucker's mom did where she partied all the time in fact it was even said that she was named after her mom's favorite drink brandy so yeah she was a bad woman growing up she had a bad influence which in turn made her a no shit badass herself she did not take shit from nobody but she was in and out by the age of 13 and 12 because of their environment she grew up in she started doing a lot of drugs partying and everything and then started find herself in and out of different juvenile d d facilities where one f one time she had had altercation with another inmate where she somehow obtained a a jar of acid where she threw after the altercation during the altercation was going on she actually threw the acid in another woman's face her, her, injuring her really bad which until I'm still trying to figure out how where does she get a jar of acid in a juvenile jail but all the same she got it and once she did get out of jail she she was bad enough as she did, it was but what really made the conjuring you know everything worse is her new boyfriend that she finally met robert coleman which himself he had just got to uh, prison for doing a 10-year sentence for second-degree murder which i saw 
what he did on a YouTube uh, channel. I saw a YouTube video about what this man did. And at first, I was like, well, why do he... Some woman actually said a uh, racial remark to him. So he turned around and punched. I guess he didn't realize how strong he was. But one punch killed her. So I thought this guy was saying because he, she named him, you know, called him a racial slur that she should he nothing should happen to him because he caught she called him a well i was like well that sounds crazy murder is murder it doesn't matter and if someone call you a name that just well, what he was really getting to was he should have got manslaughter which manslaughter and second degree murder are about the same consequences but at least you don't have murder on it but yeah he's first served 10 years and they got together and right off the back they start coming up with all kinds of bad plans and ideas what to do and they're like, we got to go and get a hit. We need some money and we need to look around and find and see what we could do. But while this was going on, she was paying respect to so a lost friend at the grave, you know, at the cemetery. She was used to go there, spend days upon and just, you know, paying respect to an individual as it would look from the outside. But in actuality, she was casing the house of Reverend Julian Brandon, a retired minister from Louisiana uh, from Shreveport there and his wife Alice Brandon to see you know get their what they're doing their kind of layout of the plan what they did what their normal routines are and just try to figure out if this was the person that they were they would be able to hit and after about a few days of monitoring they decided well well she decided you know Robert has not does not know about this yet but so she goes to him excited saying i found the hit i found the mark and we need to go do this let's go new year's day so therefore everybody be probably sleeping late and i'm guaranteed i guarantee you they probably have a lot of money because i see what they you know so they off to january 1st they went and of course they went and knocked on the door and went saw mr brent julian brandon answer the door retired minister like i said by the way, he was 70 years old, and his wife Alice was 68. So they forced their way in. As soon as they come in, they shot him near Coles range in the under jaw. The jaw was a .38 caliber. The bullet actually separated into two pieces. Fragment one went to his brain, the other exited into his head, which was later recovered from the dining room ceiling. So from there, they grabbed Mrs. Brandon and forced her into the back room and demanded cash and valuables, credit cards, or anything that they might have worth of anything. They placed a pillow over her head after they got all everything. She complied with them, of course. After they got everything that they wanted, they put a pillow over her face and shot her in the head and left her for dead. But after shooting her, they realized they still heard Mr. You know, Mr. Brandon you know, struggling with his rooms, wounds, so he was still alive. So they retrieved a couple of Chicago coloring knives from the kitchen and went there and stabbed him multiple times all over the place. Cut his throat really deep and they, they thrust a knife in him so viciously at one point it had broke off where they found pieces laying about the place. So from there they had grabbed their goods and they left, left them for dead. So after, after a while on January 5th, this was on January, murder happened on January 1st, but on January 5th, Four days after attack, Calvin Barnett Hudson, a family friend of the Brandons, became concerned that the couple did not attend church on Sundays because, you know, they are always there. Even though he was a retired minister, he still went to Sunday services every Sunday. Every time that door was open, he was in there and decided to check on see what's going on. So when he and his wife went to their friend's residence, they found Reverend Brandon lying in a pool of his own blood on the carpet Hudson immediately went to the neighbor's house and called the sheriff's department when the police respond to the call they found mr. Brandon Reverend body it was not until all the authorities checked the house they discovered mrs. Brandon was barely alive holding on that she was still after the police called in the ambulance a medical helicopter was called to transport mrs. Brandon to the hospital even though mrs. Brandon received a gunshot wound to the head she survived but at the, you know, but she re she would remain disabled and required around the clock care. So after the course, and this was all over the news, and after the television news reported the crime, the this happened in Cato Parish, 
which I have a funny one. When I hear parish, first time I, I didn't know parishes in Louisiana were actually counties. They had a parish mark on a bridge, and I called my wife. I said, Why would they do that? Of course, if you jump, you go on parish. And she said, You retarded idiot. That's what they call them. They don't call them counties, Louisiana. They call them parishes. So, but yeah, this had you know, a little side note there. Cato Parishes officer received a tip from a person at an apartment complex near a crime. The caller indicated that Brandy Robert had been bragging about the killings and el killing an elderly couple down the road near a church and that she was trying to sell them their jewelry. Detectives then went to the trailer of Brandy Bruce, Brandy's mother, which was located near the homicide scene. So they're robbing, they're, they live close to this location. There they located Brandy Robert, Brandy's mother, and Brandy's 15 year old brother. All four agreed to accompany the officers to their sheriff's office and interviews. So, over the next two days and after being Mirandaized numerous times, Brandy made six recorded and unrecorded statements implicating herself and others to various degrees in the homicide and robbery. And only the first statement did she deny involvement in the murder of Mr. Brandon. In one interview, she claimed that she was a shooter in both the murders of Mr. Brandon and the attempted murder of his wife. She further revealed that two days after the violent entry into the house, she and two of her young nephews bicycled down to the Brandon's residence. Only the youngest nephew, nine years of age, entered the residence with her, stating that she went back in the house because she dreamed that the woman was still alive, which she was. Even though she heard Mrs. Brandon's heavy breathing, she left the residence. The nine-year-old nephew entered the home with his aunt, where he observed Reverend Brandon lying in a pool of blood and had heard Mrs. Brandon screaming from another room in the home. The neighbor witnessed the two nephews fleeing from the residence, leaving Brandy inside the house. Said, Fuck this bitch, we're out of here. <laughs> in addition to several statements she made in which she attempted an involvement of violent entry to Mrs. Brand the Brandon's home and murder, police re could recover considerable circumstantial evidence demonstrating her participation. Al although the gun used in the shooting was not recovered, Ballistic evidence demonstrated that the weapon used in the Brandon's homicide was the same weapon that had belonged to Brandy's father and had been stolen from his residence in Tallertown, Mississippi. This theft occurred immediately before Brandy and Coleman traveled from Mississippi to Shreveport on Christmas Eve 2002. So, it was the Christmas before that New Year's Eve, so they, in one of the statements to the police, she admitted she had stolen her father's .380 handgun, .380 handgun while visiting in Mississippi. In addition, a surveillance video from the Herbernia Bank, H-I-B-E-R-N-I-A Bank, de de depicted her and Coleman attempting to use Brandon, Brandon's credit cards at, at the ATM, which is why I will never understand why people, when they rob someone, just take cash. Don't take anything that could be traced back t to them. And definitely not a credit card because that's all recorded. And there's cameras in every single ATM. So all they have to do if they find, you know, eventually the bodies will be found. And they will have to start. That's one of the first things they're going to look at if they notice the credit cards are missing. Let's see if they try to use them. A search of the, of course, back to the search. They're still trying to get evidence on these individuals. Of course, she's admitted to it, but she keeps giving different stories. A search of the Bruce trailer where they found Brandy Robert was staying led to the discovery of several incriminating items. A multicolored brush just found in a clear plastic food service glove was recovered from one of the rain gutters on the trailer where Brandy stayed. Mrs. Brandy's daughter identified the multicolored bracelet as one that she had given her ma sometime earlier. A box of food service gloves recovered from the bedroom that Brandy shared with Robert had a diamond pattern cons consistent with the blood transfer stains observed at the crime scene. Three fired .380, three fired shells casings were also found in the rain gutter of the trailer. Laboratory analysis revealed that the Reverend Brandy's DNA was found on these casings. Additionally, forensic analysts matched the .380 projectile recovered from Brandy's brain, Mr. Brandy's brain in a dining room ceiling to the projectiles covered from a tree at the home of the defendant's father of Brandy's father Mississippi where he had fired the tree prior to the murders so yeah so they did try to clear up the thing all the you know the murder 
but they brung it all home and if they wouldn't have been bragging about it they might have got away with it but during the interrogation while they were interrogating her about the Brandon's murder she sat there she's like well since I told you all this I might as well tell you something else she said there was another murder so regarding the she said that the participated in the homicide of Therese Blaze Terrence Blaze where she had brought him to the body regarding the blaze she originally directed authorities to the body during interrogation concerning, like I said, while the defendant originally claimed Blaze had been killed by a gang member as a result of a drug debt. Forensics evidence later just demonstrated that he had actually been killed in the car by Brandy's, own, owned by Brandy's, so they don't know, but she later confessed that they recovered that she did it. The bullet recovered from the back of Blaze's skull had the same class characteristics of the bullets recovered from the tree in Mississippi and the Brandon's house. Additionally, a cartridge case found near Blaze's body matched the cartridge case found in Mississippi, so everything's matching up. Where Brandy's father had early fired a weapon, high velocity blood splatter and other blood stains matched to Blaze were found in, in Brandy's mother's automobile on Coleman's right boot, on his right boot and right pant leg. But because evidence indicated Coleman was a driver in the vehicle while Blaze was in the passenger seat while the gunshot to the back of Blaze's head originated originated from the back seat of the car where Brandy was at so he was just sitting there he did not even see it coming while she was sitting back there he she just pulled out the gun and shot him in the back head later Brandy admitted shooting Blaze and just an unsolicited letter to just said she just felt like that and also she, she also they also tried to I guess after this this is really started I did a lot of petty but this is when we really stepped up the game when they they uh, did the Brandon's house and then after that they tried to do a violent home entry days actually days before they were actually even charged but after the brandy they tried to rob that in rot knob hills but it was unsuccessful and while the interrogation was gone somehow they left the tapes that she they were recording everything with unsecured so while they're gone she actually Brandy actually grabbed the tapes sneaking in the lady's room and flushing the magnet strip down the toilet after substituting a blank take tape at a stack of tapes so yeah there was them cop of the war right there but yeah they were left unsecured so that's what she ended up doing but they end up getting it with even without that I think they had enough written evidence because I do they think they written it down with that but they just recorded it all over again once they figured out what happened. So they charged them with first degree murder for the, the murder of Mr. Brandon, attempted murder for Mrs. Brandon, and a bunch of other charges and whatnot, robbery, consistency, and they were going for the capital murder. Now they will be tried separately on this case. You know, Robert Coleman was already, but right before the, the about a week before the trial had happened they tried to squash the whole thing saying that she should not be getting the death penalty because of her neurology she had brain issues she had claimed that she had fetal alcohol syndrome and like I said this is when I told you about I've never heard this before this is one of the reasons why I was doing this case this actually case has been for a while but yeah she said she fetal alcohol syndrome and remember I told you about her mom loved to drink a lot but yeah but it, it was this is what they said about it it was very clear that defense counsel has to make the claim because they did it right before they had this was a, a year after the murder happened so they said it was very clear the defense counsel has to make the claim first that the defendant is mentally retarded which they have not done a second before the court can make any sort of pre-trial ruling both the state and defense has to agree that this has been done which was none of this was done so they don't know but yeah the court tried and denied the defendant's re-urge to squash the case but yeah mama was a drunk and her mom actually brandy's mother did say that she drank for the first three months of the pregnancy and afterwards switched the beer she told the jury that she named the defendant you know brandy after her favorite drink that she liked she stated that brandy had a habit of eating rocks and that she was in special education classes when she was school. She also explained that Brandy was institutionalized at Sandy Hill Hospital in Mississippi for six months when she was allegedly raped by when she was at 12 years of age. And so through it all this, you know, they did tons of tests on her. 
but they do believe even if she did have fetal alcohol syndrome the medical she said that she was aware of what she was doing at the time she was aware of the consequences she was in her right mind and it should not have played any part of what she had did so but yeah she also stated by this time Robert Coleman had already been trialed and he was he found guilty of first-degree murder and attempted murder of the Brandons and they said you sir be gone with you send him to death row so what she was trying to say was that why is she being charged for death row since he's already been you know the co-defendant already been he goes the defense first contends that the state violated her due process which offered alternative theories of the crime at the trial of her co-defendant Robert Coleman had argued a different theory of the crime to the jury in her trial so they had two different stories in related matter the defendant further argues that the trial court erred when it granted the state's motion to limit limit, limit to preventing her from present evidence as either a guilt of penalty phase or anything like that so there she was complaining about that her medical issues but also but because Coleman had been convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death that why is she clearly she's not you know she was not the murderer so sh she should be be looked at for life in prison but not death penalty but yeah in her support and her argument and to the court defendant draws the attention to the United States Supreme Court decision on the Bradshaw Bradshaw versus Stroff three where they both went the Stroff and his partner Wesley both armed with guns robbed Mr. and Mrs. Stroff in the whole house in their Ohio home then they shot the couple and left them for dead police learned the the identity of the perpetrators and Stroff surrendered to the police right away after learning that Mrs. Mr. Stroff survived the shooting Stroff confessed to shooting him twice in the head but denied influencing inflicting the injuries that killed his wife so I was there I shot him but I did not shoot her Stoff pleaded guilty and proceeded to the penalty phase held before a three-judge panel in which he made a three-fold argument in mitigation. One, that he had participated in the plot at the urging of Wesley. Two, that it was Wesley who had fired the fatal shots into Mr. Stott. And three, that his minor role in the murder mitigated mil 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 yeah, against his death penalty, so he shouldn't get the death penalty. The panel rejected the stock argument and sentenced him to death. While this Wesley was successfully extradited to Ohio where the same prosecutor tried the case before the same trial judge. By the time Wesley separated the trial, new evidence had been arisen since Stoff's plea. Namely, Wesley's cellmate, Esman, one of his cellmates, testified that Wesley admitted to him that he fired the shots that killed Mrs. Stroth. The prosecutor argued that Wesley was the principal offender in Mrs. Stroth's murder, thus he should be sentenced to death. Wesley contended that the, pr the shots, mis the prosecutor had taken a contrary position in Stroth's, I'm, I'm having a hard time saying his name, Stumps, S-T-U-M-P-F, Stumps, penalty phase, and Stumps been sentenced to death of the crime. Wesley testified that had was pending, attempted to withdraw his guilty plea or vacate it vacated his death sentence. Stump action was based on the prosecution's argument at Wesley's trial that Wesley had been responsible for Mrs. Stout's death, not him. Eventually Stout's case was set in the United States Supreme Court where he urged that, that his guilty plea based on his claim was unaware of the specific intent element of the aggravated murder charge and that his due process rights had been violated to the state. But the Supreme Court, court upheld the p guilty plea, you know, as valid, and found ex he exhibited the responsibility, specific intent to support a plea of guilty uh, to aggravated murder, specifically when he put a gun to Mrs. Stout, Mr. Stout's head and fired twice. The court held that the aggravated murder charge did not require any showing that Stump had personally shot Mrs. Stump, rather than court observed Ohio considered that. You know, the violation finding that Stump and Wesley shared the same deadly intent. The court found it immaterial which two men actually shot him. So Stump and Wesley had gone to the Stump's home together carrying guns and intended to commit armed robbery. So they had the same plan. By his own admission, shot Mr. St Mr. Stout in the head at close range. Taken together, these facts 
could show that Wesley and Stump together agreed to kill both of the Stouts in order to leave no witness to the crime and then in turn could make both men guilty of aggravated murder regardless of who actually killed Mr. Stout. In the present case what we're talking about right now, the defendant contends that Coleman's trial that the state argued that he was the individual who shot Julian Brandon and inflicted the majority of the crime scene carnage. Referring to the blood spatter of Coleman's boots, the state argued that that puts those boots on the killer, sho shoving a gun up underneath Brandon's chin and pulling the trigger. Brief, but yep. After a gunshot wound, probably after several killings, stab wounds, the chest, and all which it did not sit, so they both were at it. And then he got his, he got the saw into his neck with a knife. Like I said, they, they really viciously, so that's why you need to kill him. His attack was without mercy. Then finally, her final defense of what she was trying to plead, that she says that how can she, they take any of her confessions for what it's worth because she was saying all kinds of, she attempted to demonstrate that she was not competent to stand trial because several police reports revealed that she gave inconsistent and sometimes impulsive statements concerning crimes. In particular, she points to the fact that she gave multiple versions of the incidents in effort to minimize her and her boyfriend's you know, cap capabilities of doing these crimes. But with all, they just kind of put it all together before Mr. Coleman and, not Mr. Coleman, I'm not gonna call him, Robert Coleman. They put all the evidence together and they came up with a theory of what happened and that was what they were going with. And with that, they were both, like I already told you, Robert Coleman was found guilty and was sentenced to death. And the same thing could be said about Brandy Holmes. She was, said, you ma'am? You are guilty of first degree murder, attempted murder, robbery, and a bunch of other stuff. And she was sentenced to death in Louisiana. But here it is. So, after, of course, they go straight to appeals. And after many, many appeals in 2016, they actually reversed it, stating that, that they didn't, because of, they didn't add in. You know take the accountability of her alcohol you know fetal alcohol syndrome or everything so they they switched their she was they took her anyhow they, they reversed the death penalty and gave her life in prison without parole so this, there she is she's in louisiana life in parole but she'll never get out which i think is a way better than death penalty. i think death penalty for a lot of people who you know go through this this seven in life and not to mention death penalties are so expensive for Louisiana or any state they're so ex expensive man if you're listening to this every Monday I'm talking about death penalties I'm gonna start doing every Monday I'm gonna start doing Monday murder meals which some might have last meal some might you, you have to listen to find out well have a little short history of what they did and final statements and so there it is Brandy got off because the court didn't really taken matter of the fetal alcohol system but how about Robert Coleman well him too he got off the death row because of the lack of black person because he was a Brandy Holmes was a white woman but Robert Coleman like I said because of the racial name he was a black person but because of the trial in 2016 as well they reversed his because during the trial they said it was a lack of black people on the so it was a biased you know jury so that all got overturned and he is sitting there so here there's robert and brandy are spending the rest of their life in louisiana jail and where it's right where they belong and if you go going to find a grave if you want to go pay your respects to the brandons they are buried at the forest park cemetery in shreveport louisiana on 3700 st vincent's avenue in shreveport Cabo Parish, Louisiana. He is, I said he was born August, why well, I haven't said this yet, but his birthday is August 24th, 1932. His death was January 1st, 2003. And sadly, even though she has survived the attack, she ended up dying on, in 2008, on October 8th, 2008, where they both are there. And if you do, do find, do find a grave and everything, hopefully I'll make it one day right there one day there's no picture on there but yeah a little memorial for Alice is that Alice birth brand in 75 went home to the Lord on Wednesday October 8th and talks about the services and she is she is survived by her son Mark Brandon of our Texas 
his daughter, but I'm not gonna say their names. But yeah, just if you want to know the more about the Brandons, look it up. Find a grave, and it has a little bio on them. Well, there you go. There is the crazy case of Brandy Eileen Holmes. I did find this, so if you want to watch an episode on her, she is on Deadly Women, and it just yeah, that that's just where I got some of my information on that. But a lot of it was from Murderpedia, different news clips. But yep, I finally got it done. Yay for me. Like I said, I literally every time I try to record this. I think I would try to be more technical than just talking, to, saying the story. But if you like what you heard, please write and review wherever you listen to this at. I have a YouTube channel. I'm going to start doing TikTok grave sites. It's just Gary How I think it's Gary Howard 6886. But I have a YouTube channel, Facebook, you, and you find me about everywhere. Please write and review. I have a Patreon and YouTube at truckstop murder at gmail.com help me out my wife's bitching about all the money I'm spending on this and having nothing coming in so thank you for good listening and as I always say you can't fix stupid but you can sure numb in with the two before and if you can hear my truck running sorry but I am been messing with this case for so long and my truck has to opt the idle and it turned itself on because the battery was getting low and I decided I am not turning it off so if you hear it I think it gives it more character but yeah I am out of here <laughs>